So I've had this drinking horn for a couple of years now, and when I bought it, it came with this leather drinking horn holder. However, last year, I bought this really cool drinking horn, and now I need a really cool drinking horn holder to go with it. Join me down the crafting rabbit hole as I create my over-the-top leather drinking horn. Holder. Leather horn holder. So here's the basic issue I had. The leather horn holder that came with my previous drinking horn is a little bit too small for the new horn that I have. So I need to replace this with something that's a little bit bigger. Now I came up with this mock-up after tracing both this pattern on, onto paper as well as looking at a couple designs online. And although the horn fits in here, it's kind of boring looking. So what I decided to do was to do something with this area here and here on the horn to make it pop a little bit more. Now, instead of doing something under this leather itself, what I decided to do was put a piece of gilded leather on top of here and stitch it into place on both sides. I figured that would really make it look cool. Now, I'm not an artist, so I needed to find some artwork online that I could use to put onto the leather. I found this pretty cool design. Now, I only need a small fraction of it for my purpose, but I think it will work well. Here's the piece of the pattern that I cut out that shows the actual size I need. Once I ensure that the pattern really will fit the piece, I tape some of the tracing film down to the paper and get to work. I don't tape all the way around because I need to lift it up periodically to see that I've actually traced everything I want. I also don't tape it too close to the edge of the artwork, since for something this size, I'll place the leather right onto the paper and let the tracing sit on top of that. You really don't want the tracing paper to move once you've started that part. I'm using a pencil for this because sometimes I make mistakes and need to erase something to redo it. For this project, I plan to flip the carving on the two halves, so I only need to trace this onto the tracing film once and can reuse it for the other side. Now that I have the tracing, I need the leather. I don't need particularly large pieces, so I'm just using some scrap that I had laying around the shop. I'm using a pin to trace around the pattern since I'll bevel the edges later and that will remove the ink. And every time before I cut, I sharpen the knife to make sure the cut is as smooth as possible. For the strap, I have the pattern, but it's so close to the width of the ruler, I'm just going to use that instead. With the tracing done, I need to transfer it now to the leather. I need to wet the leather in order for the tracing to show up. This is called casing the leather. I do this a couple of different ways. One is with a wet sponge, but I also keep a spray bottle of water handy to wet the leather at times. So the first thing I need to do is draw a border around the edge of the insert. For that, we're using some calipers so it's the same distance from the edge. The carving will all be inside of this area, and the stitching will be in the middle of this area between that line and the edge of the piece. These pieces I'm doing are pretty small, so I can place them directly onto the paper I had the pattern on and use that to help turn the leather as I work on it, as well as keeping the tracing paper in place. I'm using a stylus to actually transfer the pattern onto the leather. After I align it carefully, I can start the tracing. Now instead of the stylus, I've also just used a pencil in the past and that works pretty well. I've also seen some folks use a colored pen so they can see exactly what they've already done. But since I'm using the stylus, you'll see me flip up the tracing paper periodically so I can see if there's anything I've missed. <laughs> 
With the tracing done, you can see the pattern on the leather. It's now time to carve it. I'm using a swivel knife to do this. Now there are lots of videos on YouTube that show how to do that. There are a couple of important things that I've learned that I do want to share with you. One, you need to make sure the leather is appropriately cased. If it's not wet enough, you'll have issues. You also want to use a sharp knife, so I strop the blade every time before using it. You want to keep the wrist as rigid as possible, which helps to keep your line smooth. The other is to not tilt the knife side to side when carving. Otherwise, you can undercut the leather, which will cause it to lift up later on. I've also been told you aren't supposed to connect the lines fully, but I'm not that good about leaving the gap. This is also supposed to help things from flipping up later on. This took about 10 minutes to carve this piece here if you're curious how long it actually took. I decided not to make you watch the whole thing at speed. Alright, so here you can see what the carved piece looks like. I think I have carved everything on there. I'll get the matching one done on the other side, and then it's on to stamping. Now I have a lot of tools that I can use when I'm tooling leather, but for a design like this, I don't need to use that many. I've got two textured bevelers of different widths, a smooth beveler, something called a camouflage tool, and then a stamp that'll put a pretty cool braid look onto the belt strap. And then finally, I've also got this backgrounder that's a teardrop shape that I'll use to help put the eye into the pattern. So I'm using a maul to tap the stamps. You don't need to hit these hard. It's actually a pretty gentle tapping as you move the tool down the carved lines. This was about 10 minutes worth of work here for one side, so it took about 20 minutes for both. Now that we're done, I think you can really appreciate how the carving and stamping really gives it a 3D kind of look. But one of the issues we have as you go over the, with the stamps is sometimes the lines get a little mushy. So what we can do is re-carve the line to kind of crisp up the places where the carving no longer stands out. This is primarily where parts of the serpent are crossing under and over each other. I can also clean up the look a little bit more when we do the gilding. But anyways, now you can compare the two pieces, stamped versus unstamped. One thing that was in the original artwork is they had a little eye thing here. I don't have a stamp that looks exactly like that, but I do have something that has a teardrop look to it. And I'll use that pretty regularly for things like this. Now this one is a little bit on the big side, so I'll keep it angled so I don't use the whole piece. The final step in this will be to use a smooth beveler for the outside edge. At this point before staining, it's time to clean the edges of the leather a little bit. An edge beveler is used to cut off a thin strip of leather so that the edges will be smoother. Later on, we'll also slick the edges down so that they stay together better. I'm using leather that's two different thicknesses, so I have two different sizes of tools that I'm using here. I also do the back of the main piece, since both sides will be exposed. I didn't need to do the back of the inserts, since they'll be stitched down. Next, I use a stitch groover to mark where the holes will go in the inserts. The stitching chisel will fit nicely into this groove once it's done. For making the holes for stitching, I have several different sets of tools that I have 
that have different widths for how far apart the stitches are. You can see for this set, it comes with four tools with different sets of tines on each of them, and each of these are evenly spaced at four millimeters apart. Now to hammer these into the leather, I'm using this hammer that has a plastic head on it. If you use a regular hammer with a metal head onto it, it'll actually mushroom out the top of the tools, which will decrease their lifespan. So with these stitching chisels and this hammer, let's get to work. I do this on a cutting board. You should check to be sure the chisel goes all the way through the leather. You can feel them on the other side here. And then for the next one, you put the first tine into the last hole so that the width between all the holes is consistent. When you get close to the end, you might see that it doesn't line up where you want it to. So you place the tool all the way at the corner and then use a smaller chisel to fill in the space between the two sets afterwards. And here you see all of one side done. Now for the belt loop. I just roughly cut a piece of leather for this before, so I now I need to work on that. I use the lines on the cutting mat to make sure I'm making perpendicular cuts. Then it's time to wet the leather, then stamp it. For this, I'm using a cool stamp that looks like a braid. I'll score some lines for the placement of those stamps, then stamp along the length on both sides. I'm doing this on my marble slab to give me something firm to hammer against to make the impressions as sharp and crisp as possible. Now I can't get the stamp all the way to the end, so I'm using a tool called a camouflage at the end of both sides. Now at this point, I realized I hadn't rounded the edge of the strap like I had planned to. Oops. So using a corner template, I round the corners. I will say that I don't like cutting on top of this cutting board. The cutting mat is a much easier surface to cut on, but I was too lazy to move the paper I needed for the next step. So now it's time to start staining everything. I need to use gloves as I'm using Phoebing's Pro Dye and that can take days to wash off your hands if you're not careful. I'm using some cotton daubers to apply the stain since I'm staining the whole pieces. I'm using two different colors here. The big pieces will be a lighter colored saddle tan and for the inserts I'm using show brown. I'm doing the front and edges of everything but I only need to do the backs of the bigger pieces. No one's going to see the backs of the inserts since they'll be sewn down. I also forgot to bevel the edge of the belt loop before I dyed it, so I'm doing that now. Luckily, it didn't take off so much that the raw leather color showed through. Also, since the edges of the inserts are now wet, I decided to go ahead and slick them with the edge slicker. In general, I probably should have done this before I punched the holes. But when you use the edge slicker, you aren't supposed to apply too much pressure. It's the friction that builds up heat that helps to hold the fibers together more than the pressure. So luckily I didn't close the holes together. With all that done, it's now time to gild the leather. We're going to do that by applying glue, which is also called size when you're gilding, to all of the raised areas of the pattern that I've carved. What you'll do is, you'll, once that glue dries, you'll put the foil sheets on top of that, and the foil will stick to everywhere with the glue, but easily flake off everywhere where there's not any glue. I'm using a paintbrush to apply the size to the carved areas. 
It goes on blue, and once it dries, it'll be clear. This is how you know it's ready to accept the gold sheets. I've tried using glue pins in the past, but they didn't work as well for me as I would have liked. The glue is shiny, so you can clearly see where it's already been applied fairly well. If you put a little where it isn't supposed to go, I'll show you how to clean that up later. One side all done now, and you can really appreciate where all the glue is going, which will be exactly where the guild sticks to later on. Now that both pieces are done, it's time to place the foil on it. I'm using some foil I found on Amazon. It's not real gold leaf, which I might want to use sometime when I have something that really deserves it. The other tool I'm using here is a very soft brush for helping to make sure the leaf is attached to everywhere it should be, but not to where it's not. I normally do this first part inside, but then take it outside for when you see the gold leaf start flaking apart. This is fragile enough that anything not glued down will fall apart and it ends up everywhere. I've been banned from doing this in the kitchen. Now that I can see where the gold leaf is stuck to, I can see some glue was in places I didn't want it to be, so I take a scalpel and carefully scrape away the excess to clean it up. Now you can see the final product, shiny. So one of the curses of a messy shop is sometimes you lose things. I couldn't find my pattern for this belt strap, so I needed to use my mock-up I used when testing the project to determine where I wanted the holes put into this piece. But using an existing piece as a pattern for a new piece is a time-honored technique, which is why I'm showing you what I did here. I'm using a 3mm punch for the holes for the rivets. Now that I feel good about this piece, I need to punch the holes for the lacing. That lacing is a little thick, so I'm going to use a 4mm punch instead for that. I wanted 5 holes along each edge, so I did the ends, the middle, then evenly spaced out the other two on each side. And here's the current state of the piece. If you don't seal the leather pieces, you run the risk of the dye rubbing off onto something, which can be bad. So we'll seal the pieces with a flexible acrylic coating called Resoline. This can be applied a couple of different ways. Here I'm just using an old t-shirt. The instructions say to dampen whatever you're using a little, so I dip the shirt into a bit of water, then into the Resoline, and then wipe it onto the piece. It also recommends doing long strokes in a single direction, so you'll see me doing that here. Now I don't want the resoline to get onto the pieces where I'll glue the inserts onto, since that can cause the glue not to stick as well. A general step I take near the end of a project is to use antiquing on it. This does a couple of things. First, for me it really helps the stamping stand out. Second, it highlights some of the imperfections in the leather, which is actually desirable when you want something to look more homemade and weathered. There are several different types of antique, and here I'm using a gel. It also comes in a paste I've used at times. And in reality, I've also just seen people use a darker stain. But you do need to do this after you've sealed the leather, or the color will just overwhelm what you've done before. On this piece, you can really appreciate the difference between applying the antique to something that hasn't been sealed all the way, as opposed to putting it over the resoline. I want to glue these pieces together to hold them in place before I stitch them. 
The glue will stick good to the back side since it isn't finished, but sometimes it won't stick as well to the front of a piece. That's why I avoided applying Resoline to this section, but I can also rough it up a little bit using this scratch stick to help the glue stick a little bit better. That's what I'm doing here. Then we apply the glue and put the pieces in place. Earlier, you saw me hand apply some Resoline. I still need another coat or two of it since I've added the antique gel, but I can't do that as easily with the pieces assembled like this. So this time I'll use an airbrush to apply it. The techniques for airbrushing are similar to those when you're using a spray can in that you want to start and stop the spraying when your hand is moving. You also want to start and stop off the edge of the piece to get a nice consistent coat. I'm always surprised by how quick the Resoline dries when applied this way. Earlier, I made the holes around the gilded pieces, but there weren't any holes on the base piece. So now I need to use an awl to punch through the bottom piece prior to stitching them together. I'm using a piece of cork underneath the piece and on top of the cutting board so that the awl can push through far enough for my needle and thread to easily get through the hole I've just made. I'll also normally do this standing up since it's easier to get the pressure I need to push through. Once I get done with this, I don't need to worry if the pieces were to separate since the holes are in the right place on both sides. Before I rivet the strap to the belt, I really want to make sure the edges are as smooth as possible. I did this a little bit before, but now I'm going to use something called Tokenol to make it even smoother. A smooth edge to a project can really make it stand out. Now it's time for stitching. One decision you need to make for every project is what color thread are you going to use? Are you going to use something that is the same color as the leather that you're using? Or do you want to use something that contrasts with it like you see that I've used in this project? Now for this project, it's already going to be pretty fancy with the gilding on the leather, so I'm going for a plain brown thread instead. Knowing how much thread to use has always been a bit on the tricky side for me to figure out. So I just try and make sure I give myself more than I think I need since it's always easier to have too much than to stop midway, tie it off, and have to load another couple of needles to get more thread ready to go. Once you thread your needles, you need to lock the thread into place. The way I do that is you give yourself a little flat spot on the thread an inch or two up, pass the needle through the middle of that section, then pull it up and over the needle and pull it tight. This way when you're pulling the needle through the leather, you don't have to worry about the thread coming out. Now you don't want to do this too close to the end of the thread or too close to the sides of it. Do either of those, then you run the risk that it'll pull through if you put too much tension on the needle. All right, now it's time to stitch this together. Sometimes I'll use a stitching pony for something like this, but usually I find it a little easier not to use one. I'm using what's referred to as a saddle stitch here, where the thread just goes back and forth from both sides. Once you get to the end, you tie a square knot in the thread, cut it with a little bit of tail end to the threads, then burn them down to keep it from coming undone. And now the final stretch. First thing I'm going to do is hammer down the stitches. This does two things. First, it helps to make all the stitches look more consistent. You won't be able to appreciate that as much here, but it stands out a lot more if I'm using contrast stitching. It'll also flatten the knot on the back side of the project, making it smooth. For this, you'll notice I'm using a normal hammer since it's got a smooth surface to it. <laughs> 
All right, now I want to attach the belt strap. The holes in this strap are further from the edge on one side, and I want that longer one to be on the outside of the project. So we'll take our longer part of the double cap rivets through the leather, then flip it over, we'll put the caps on. I'm going to set this on a little concave danville since that keeps the rivets from getting too flat when you hammer them. The striking tool also has a little bit of a concave part to help from the rivets from getting too flat. All right, the rivets are in there with a nice tight fit. Now we need to bend this into shape. We need to do this slowly, since otherwise we risk the gilding cracking on the inserts here. Although I'm not worried about the inserts coming off since they are stitched in good. Here's my lace. I cut this about 18 inches. Time to feed this through the holes. And now it's time for a first test fit against the horn. Wow, I like this. Last thing we need to do is make a little piece to hold the ends of the lace together. For that, I'm just cutting a little square piece of leather and putting a hole into each corner. That's the way I've seen this done most often. I'm just cutting this from another scrap piece of leather I had here in the shop, just like I did for the rest of this project. This project has cost me a lot of time, but not a lot of money. So we put the lace through the opposite holes. And we're done. So there we have it. That's how I created this over-the-top leather drinking horn holder for my over-the-top drinking horn. Thanks for joining me down the crafting rabbit hole of this build. See you next time.